through the usual uh, formalities. And we'll go right into the reason that we're here. But before uh, we start the process, I want to indicate that there is a fallen officer memorial a program that starts at 10 o'clock. The council has got to be there. I'm leading the pledge. So wherever we are in this process, at five minutes to 10, we're going to have to leave. So hopefully we'll be able to have completed the process by that time. If not, then we'll have to consider reconvening at, a, at another time. I have had two competing requests uh, to go first. Uh, I think the, the BIA folks have decided to let Ira Norris go first. I would indicate that when we uh, broke last time, it was Mr. Williams who had five minutes, and obviously that was not sufficient time. So uh, we'll follow the request that Ira Norris speak first. And then I believe there's a representative from the Rose Institute that Frank Williams wants to speak a second. And then we'll go back to Frank Williams uh, at that point. So with that, by the way, if you're going to address the council, please fill out one of these cards. They're available in the foyer and pass them to uh, the city clerk. And uh, with that, I'll invite Ira Norris. Mayor, by law, you do have to open for public comment. Well, if you're going to speak under public comment, uh, also fill out one of these cards, please. Is there anybody here? I have no cards for public comment, but is there anybody here who uh, wishes or had intended to speak under uh, item one, which is public comment? If not, now if Mr. D. Bortonowski is happy, we'll go to item two and we'll let Mr. Norris speak. My day, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is obviously taking a lot of time for the city and for the building industry to try, to try and do something to um, get some economic activity under these very difficult times. Uh, I really felt at the last meeting that it was interesting that we had the opportunity to listen to all the department heads and how they felt about these particular issues. And when I, when I was sitting here, some of the things I disagreed with and I wanted to jump up and say something, but on the way home, I started thinking about what was said and it kind of struck me how that we are really not in disagreement with one another. Uh, first, Mr. Sullivan, I thought, said it very clearly and concisely that a, any kind of a long-term change in diff fees is very devastating to the city and to the projects. And we, we totally agree with that. We do understand that. He did mention, and, and I will continue to mention, that we are only discussing a short-term interim solution to try and jumpstart what we're doing. Um, the thing that kind of got to me was the comments made by a lot of people here about not wanting everything entry level. And we certainly do understand that and every city needs to be balanced in its development. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time all over the country. And going into emerging cities, the first thing that always happens is that entry level housing starts. Somehow the initial developments never are upscale. They just wanna get the area started. So you need to bring in folks who can afford to live there. They've become the basis of a workforce. And when enough of them are there, some shopping centers, other retail type establishments appear. And before you know it, you begin to, to get started. And then later on down the line, industrial development will come in and then things begin to really go. Of course, along the way, you need schools, fire stations, and so on. And it's a, it's a struggle. People constantly ask, why can't we get the infrastructure first before we get the builders in? It's a great idea, except who's going to put the money up first? The builder ha doesn't have it, can't get it from the bank because there's nothing to give the bank as collateral. So we wind up uh, doing what we're doing now. We used to be uh, in California before Prop 13, was paid, paid by real estate taxes. Well, that's no longer the case. So we've developed fees, which in effect, the builders are paying the real estate taxes that would have otherwise been paid uh, under Prop 13. In any event, um, as, you, as we look at the development of the city of Victorville, uh, and uh, going all the way back to the Tatum family, we began here with uh, and did an unbelievable job and became a pillar in this community. Uh, and they started with smaller 
entry-level homes, and we've seen that development go on. But you know, the only thing I, I kind of disagreed with from the last meeting was that people were saying we don't do upscale housing here. Well, I kind of started thinking back. Back in uh, 1990, if you folks remember, uh, some very nice builder named Norris went out and built Eagle Ranch. And Eagle Ranch, if you recall, we had 3,000 square foot two stories on large lots, uh, upscale pricing. Uh, Eagle Ranch was, a, was a definitely an upscale project. So what happened by then is that the city of Victorville had developed, there were businesses in town, there were retail establishments, there were managers, owners, uh, middle management, folks that were earning a decent living. And we sold a lot, a lot of houses in Eagle Ranch until George closed and everything went downhill. But Eagle Ranch was an extremely successful upscale development. And we even had a three different price levels, a lower price, medium, and a higher price. And higher price homes did extremely well, and we put them on larger lots that were 10,000 square feet to 15,000 square feet. And if I remember correctly, I think, Terry, your, your wife even wanted to, to move over there because she really liked what we were doing, but she refused to do it. Anyway. Um, because I was in a nice... Tatum home. Tatum home. I understand that. First <laughs> and, and I subordinate all my interests to Mr. Tatum. Absolutely. So we have had, and we will continue to have, upscale development. When the market got back, it started to come back in 01, and things began to, began to get better. And we built a project over on Amethyst um, in La Mesa called Rogers Ranch, which the Rogers family was very gracious to allow us to use their name and likenesses. And guess what? We had houses for $425,000 in Rogers Ranch. I think of an extremely astute and alert and brilliant councilman uh, uh, bought a house there. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Hunter. However, um, the point I'm trying to bring out is we all do want upscale development. We are going to have balanced development. But what has happened since Rogers Ranch and the other upscale developments, and let's not forget, many builders came into town, many of the public builders, 350, 400, 450. Those were the price ranges that we saw in 04, 05, and 06 because the city was developing new shopping centers, new businesses were coming in. There were people who were making money. There were more attorneys, accountants, uh, real estate brokers, insurance people, escrow and banks, lots of, lots of activity was going on. And there are a lot of people in those uh, occupations where there are highly paid people. And we, frankly, would much prefer to be able to sell a $450,000 house before a two fifty. dollars There's much more profit in that house. We certainly all would be thrilled to death to be able to do that. And we will be able to do that again. And uh, I really agree with the people, with the staff and the city uh, and the comments that were made last meeting. We, we need to do that and we will do that. And frankly, we're your partners in that. We want that to happen. So nobody is saying that because of what we're asking today to reduce fees on a temporary basis, that we're gonna build nothing but entry level houses from now on. Absolutely not the case. We will have to build, if we wanna do anything right now, we have to. The reason? So many foreclosures out there coming on the market at very low prices, and the city gets nothing for that. There's, there are no fees, no transfer taxes, no re revenue to the city whatsoever when foreclosed homes get resold at low prices. This is a temporary phenomenon that's probably going to go on for several more months, year, year and a half. We don't really know. But there's a lot of volume in that, in that situation. Additionally, we are faced with approximately 1,000 standing finished homes built by our, some of our builder brethren who just thought the market was great, went ahead and built houses without buyers, and a thousand of them still don't have buyers. And until they, they get off the market, we're going to be in serious trouble trying to compete with them. Many of these companies are New York Stock Exchange companies. They have a lot of financial strength. And uh, one example was that uh, Horton built a 3,200 square foot house. He built 68 houses on spec in one development and put a 3,200 square foot house on the market for $220,000.
How do you compete with that? I mean, there's nothing in the world. They're losing a fortune on that house, and builders like us can't, obviously can't do that. So what we need to do is to, com is to go along and compete with foreclosures and to show people that if they buy a new house from us, they don't have to worry about the problems of foreclosures. Because one of our new slogans is going to be, as is, is no warranty. And that's what happens when people buy a foreclosure. What are they really buying? Did the former owners take care of it? Probably not, because they were being tossed out of there anyway. So uh, we have to compete with these foreclosures. And on a temporary basis, that's the only market. The real estate brokers will tell you that they've had some of their best months ever with these foreclosures on the market, because at the prices levels that they hit, there's a market. And that's the only market that exists now, and probably for several more months. So what we are really saying is, we have, if we want to build, put people to work, pay fees to the city, put our people back to work, and frankly, keep our businesses going, the only way that's going to happen is if we can compete with the foreclosures. We can be a little higher price, I think, because we're offering a full warranty brand new houses, brand new everything, and we think that that's going to work. But we can't do that competing with the current price levels at the current DIFI levels. It just, the numbers just don't work. We are very happy to work for zero profit, and right now we are, every sale we make, which is just not often enough, we're losing money. And we, we understand that. We're here to keep the business going, not to fire everybody and, and lock the doors, we're here to stay in business, and we need for the temporary time period, and it's very difficult for us to tell you right here how many months it's going to be until we can begin to bring the price levels up. I don't want to build houses at foreclosure prices for a long time. I'm losing money as it is. We want to build, we want to get the prices back up as quickly as we can, but we need to show some economic activity. And the only way this is going to happen is if on a temporary basis we work together to give us the opportunity by some temporary fee reductions to let us build. We have the land, we have the lots, we're ready to go, but what are we going to do? We, we're just struggling as, as mightily as we have ever struck, uh, struggled in this economic situation. So. Uh, I, again, I'm just repeating, I didn't disagree with anybody who spoke at the last meeting from the city. I thought everybody had a decent agenda, protecting the city and trying to do the right thing. We want to do the right thing as well. We want to bring some economic activity, get this place back on its feet from a housing standpoint. You got, you're, you're doing your job trying to bring industry in, and that's going to make a huge difference. And as soon as those employees begin to come up here, that's going to shorten the time period where we're having to build at the currently uh, low price foreclosure price levels. So we're hoping that we can work out something with you folks, and I want to thank you for your time, and thank you for the courtesy of letting me go first. Mr. Norris, before we leave, and I know you've got a tight time frame, is there any questions or comments from members of the council? I do. Um, I know you mentioned you, you couldn't determine the, the length of the short-term program, which bothers me a bit. I can't sit up here in the dais and say, okay, or give this the stimulus package for an unknown period of short time. I understand that. I need to know a time. Secondly, what $6,300 is going to affect your per, per square foot cost? Well, it depends on how big the house is. Um, well, we, we're not looking at it on a per square foot, but let me go back to your first comment. I agree with you that you, this can't be an, undeterm an undeterminable period of time. We need to establish X number of months, and then at that time we will sit down and either renew it or end it. So we, we do it maybe in six or 12 month increments and say, okay, for, we'll do it for this period of time, and then we'll revisit it and decide how we want to go. That's the only way that it makes any sense, I think. Secondly, as far as the square foot cost, Bob, we're looking at our bottom line. Um, if we could, if we could reduce our cost by 6,300, if we could, and we are, by the way, we are rebidding the jobs. We're asking our subs to, and they they seem to be willing to do that. They're willing now to either make no money or even lose a little money to keep their shops going. So we're all trying to do that so that we can get some houses started. 
uh, you're going to see some new billboards that we're starting that's got a, you know, the Aflac goose. Well, we've got the Horizon chicken. And there's this chicken on the billboard now, and it says, Clucky, you, I hate to tell you what my son wanted to put on the billboard. We called Bob Hunter, and he said, don't you dare do that. And I'm not going to say it from, this, from the roster here. <laughs> but uh, we are um, trying, uh, Mr. Hunter, just to get our total cost down and to break even. But to, to answer your question, if we've got a thousand foot house and we've got a, or you're using as an example, it's six bucks a foot. So it's, it's significant, but you can adjust it for the square footage of the house. I ask you this, since I highly respect you in the industry and cares about the city of Victorville. I care about the city as much as you do. How do I, how do I answer people that come to me and say, of the building industry, the stimulus package. What about my car dealership? That I'm not trying to business that says, I need a stimulus package to help me. What about all the other businesses in town that want to have the same thing? How do I set a precedent with BIA and not do it for everybody else? Well, there's one very interesting way. Before you answer that, I, I, I want to echo that question because I will tell you that there are probably three new car dealers who have approached me and probably five or six retailers who've been watching this and have said, we'll be there, we're going to ask for sales tax rebate or sales tax relief. So I mean, it, it's, a, it's a difficult public policy issue that we've got to deal with. Um, it's not your problem, but it's something we have to do. I, I understand your problem. I was going to. What? My answer to you, and I, you know, I, I'm caught quick, you know, blindsided a little bit by the question, but my answer would be right off the top of my head, you people have a store and you already have your employees, and now you want a rebate. What we're trying to get the building industry to do is bring jobs back to put people to work. If you, if they, if you give a, a dealer sales tax revenue, he doesn't have to hire any more people. If he sells more cars, he's still got his mechanics, he's got his salespeople. And here we're trying to, to put hundreds if not thousands of people to work building houses. And it, it, the, uh, it goes from suppliers to escrow companies to insurance agencies to subcontractors. We are the second largest employer in America, second only to farming. So we are the job generators and I think that's the quick, that's the first answer that comes to mind. The only comment I have to you, you mentioned that the, the uh, foreclosures don't have an effect on the city. Financially, yes, you're probably right, but they have much more impact on the city. When we have foreclosures, it drags the city down. The looks, the aesthetics of this city, you know, we, we have a lot of problems. When people buy those homes and go back with the pride of ownership, it affects the neighborhoods drastically. It affects the home prices drastically. So it does affect our city. And I understand what you're saying. Financially, we don't get anything out of that. Yeah, you don't get but, any money out of it. But down the yeah. line, we do get something Absolutely. out of it. We get tax generation. We get more people coming in town. And I got to tell you, looking at the multiple listing service this morning and, and the homes that are out there, we have homes out there, as you know, for $70 a square foot, brand new one-year, two-year-old homes at $70 a square foot. I don't know how you're going to compete. I honestly don't. Even with a $6,300 ding down, I don't know how you're going to do it. I calculated out. You said a thousand. I said fifteen hundred square feet is four dollars and twenty cents a square foot. How can you compete until we get that that down? One of the issues, Bob, is we were able to buy some land from builders who left town. We just bought one from Centex, as you're aware, at an unbelievably low price. And the answer, the answer is that's how we can do it. If we were really looking only for money, I would sit on that land for two or three years and make a normal house profit. If we start those early, we're going to sacrifice that profit to keep our operation going. Uh, but I do understand that, and what I meant about the foreclosures is you don't receive any fees or any other kind of revenue. I do understand the need to bring those people in and sales tax revenue. That's part of what the BIA sells you on anyway, is that we bring in people who are customers in, in the retail stores. That's part of what we do for a city because people always scream, well, housing doesn't pay for itself, but without housing, nothing else pays for itself. Interesting on the issue of foreclosures, you know, we've tried to implement a program similar to the county uh, where whoever ends up with the house, the institutional, required to spend the money to at least maintain mm -hmm. uh, some semblance of uh, 
because. But now we're getting pushback from everybody who's saying essentially the same thing you are. Our industry is crumbling, and if you put these costs on us, it's going to make it more difficult. We won't have the same dollars to lend. So it's, it's like an epidemic in terms of everybody's getting their ox gourd, and everybody is looking to government to come in and provide some type of a Band-Aid. And I'm not taking a position whether that's right or wrong. It's just the reality of it. Yeah. If you think this dialogue is exclusive to you and to the BIA, it is. Well, I understand that. I think it's, it's an indication of how deep and serious the economic situation is. It is very serious, in particular, if you read what we read that's builder-oriented documents and news, newsletters and data and reports, the Inland Empire is one of the worst in the country. Second worst. I said one of the worst. Yeah, it is, it's number two. But it's, it's California, is Florida, uh, somewhere else in Florida, is that worse? If Florida, California, and Nevada are, are the three worst. And in California, we're the worst right here. They're probably, if you looked at it on a per capita basis, the high desert probably has more foreclosures per square, per, per capita than anywhere else. We're really suffering here. There's no question about it. I, I read, just to address that uh, question about when this might turn around, I, yesterday on the fo internet, Fox News, uh, there was an interview from the guy, the CEO of KB Homes or somebody at that level, yes. and he had indicated that their studies said that things are settling at now, but he says you're not at the bottom yet. At the end of this year, you'll, we should be at the bottom. There should be a, a, a definite turn. Is that something that you've seen, or is that just something I just What well, we see, you know, Mike, when you look at housing, if you have to look at your individual marketplace. KB is a national home builder, actually an international home builder. So I'm not sure whose statistics they're talking about, but I can statistics in the Victor Valley might be totally different than statistics in Ventura County or Orange County. What we're looking at is this. We have to get rid of the 1,000 plus or minus standing builder inventory homes because they're being offered at non-market prices. They're just whatever, they're sacred, whatever price they can get, they're taking. So they're, they're skewing the market, You've already, and, and that's one. So we've got to get rid of them. Secondly, we have to begin to cut into the foreclosures. Now, there was a very interesting statistic yesterday that there was a significant drop in the statewide in California for the number of foreclosures filed in April. So that was, a, to me, that was the first real sounding good news. This thing is so difficult to, to predict, and now, you know, all the things we're talking about, we haven't discussed the fact that the banks aren't lending to builders. There isn't the liquidity in that system. We've got banks that are going out of the business. They're calling their loans due. The builders are having serious problems trying to get loans right now. And that's hurting as well. So we need to get that credit crunch thing, and that's more on a, on a macro level, to get the banks to willing to, to lend to guys like Jim and me. And that is not an easy thing today. That's just one more thing we're dealing with. But as soon as the foreclosures begin to tail off, which they said is beginning in April, now we'll see if that May, June, if that, that continues to hold. But we think it'll take the better part of 08 into the early part of 09 to get rid of that 1,000 home builder inventory. Then we're, our guess is if we had another year on the foreclosures, I would, that's where I would bet on it, that we have one more year of, of foreclosure problems, which throws us into the next spring. And I think by next spring, things ought to be better. But, you know, I've been so wrong in the past, Mike, who the heck knows? I can't, you know, I don't know more than anybody else, and we're all guessing. Other questions or comments? Question. Uh, the thousand inventory that you mentioned, those are the ones that you already have. So, so the reduction or suspension or uh, won't doesn't it affect that at all. That. It's just Those fees are already paid and they're done, and we're not at, we're asking. The re, what we're talking about is for the building permits that are going to be taken out for the next X months or whatever we decide the time frames work out to be. Those permits get the reduction, and only those. And hopefully it's a shorter time period. Questions or comments? Right well, I know you have an important meeting, so. Thank you. Thank you for Appreciate coming Appreciate your up. courtesy. Thanks very much. Where's your son? Because he's usually a lot more uh, interesting to chat with than you. Um, <laughs> although I didn't want to say from the roster, but his wife is, um, is going in a medical procedure this morning. Good enough reason. Thank you. Mr. Williams indicated that the next person, because of a pressing time schedule away, uh, as well as Manfred Keel.
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council Members. Um, I had made a presentation here um, a few weeks ago, and I was unable to come uh, for the last meeting. So I was only told indirectly the comments that were made and so forth. But, but I do have all the memos that were passed out and so forth. Um, let, let me say up front that uh, I fully realize that I'm an outsider here. Uh, I do not live in Victorville. Uh, and, and although I've analyzed many aspects of Victorville, I'm, I'm obviously not a resident. Um, I thought, given the comments that staff had written up, I thought it would be best, instead of getting into details, um, to, to make a few general statements first to, to explain to you the intent of, of, the, of the report. And the intent was to paint the big picture that uh, the, the Victorville housing market is, is in a depression. And I think there's, there's little doubt about that. So I'm, I'm in many ways stating the obvious. The report then went on to say there, there's a wonderful long-term solution inside, SCLA, and you are more lucky than, than many other communities, or you've worked hard enough on this, instead of calling it lucky. To, to have a solution inside, and, and that's, that's wonderful, but it will not happen for a few years. Uh, and therefore, a, a short-term relief was, was needed. Um, and, and that was against the backdrop of uh, a, a serious loss in general funds and, and diffs. So, so we were fully aware of that. So, so then we thought, what, what solutions are there? Um, and, and, of course, we had no idea what, what the city's plan are or the, or the council's uh, plan are. And ideally, the, the city would have um, some, some funds to stimulate the local economy. Um, but it's understandable that, that the city does not have that. Um, ideally, that's how one would get out of, out of a recession like that because there's not going to be any help from the state, and, and we've received, some of us, I certainly have, uh, received the, the income tax uh, rebate, but, but that's all that is, that is uh, there at the moment. Um, one way to make up for the, the drop in, in, uh, in the general fund and in, in DIFFs would be, of course, to increase taxes uh, and, and fees, and that has been done uh, in, the, in the past, in the Great Depression, and, and uh, in the 30s, and that, that was a disaster. Um, uh, so what, what alternatives are there to stimulate uh, the local economy without additional funds? That, that's the problem. And so our proposal was to have a short-term solution, uh, and that was to cut back in, in the diffs, specifically uh, after, after reconsidering everything in the park and facilities fees. And, and to make this a very temporary uh, program to uh, answer Council Member Hunter's previous question, our proposal was to make this a two-year program and that could be reevaluated after a year to consider if it should be extended or not. A after looking at the numbers that, that have been generated. But, but of course, whether you want to make this a two-year deal or a one-year deal or a year and a half or so, that, that uh, is, is not a detail that we wanted to get uh, involved uh, with. T to answer Council Member Hunter's other question in terms of the car dealers, um, what our proposal tried to show was that under certain, what we considered plausible assumption, it would be revenue neutral. Um, and, and I guess that is uh, one of the answers that, that I would give, other than the answers you, you eloquently brought up afterwards that there is much more with houses in terms of empty buildings, neighborhoods, and so forth that, that, that is relevant. Um, so, so the whole point of our presentation was under plausible assumption it was revenue neutral. Well, then um, staff brought up several uh, issues, uh, some of which I, I have to admit uh, were, were hard to um, digest. Others were, were very reasonable. Uh, such as what kind of fees 
actually coming back to the city and so forth. And, and we have renewed our calculations. And we figure out now, depending on which fees would go uh, to the city or not, namely if you had base fees versus capital fees, you would need roughly 27 new houses or 64 new houses, depending on which one one chooses, additional houses to break even on, on the revenue. Uh, one council member calculated that with the 2008 numbers, uh, our proposal would suggest uh, 25 additional houses. I, I don't know. I have to redo those calculations. Um, but, but, but one is certainly in the vicinity of, of making this revenue neutral, and that was the whole point. I, I wanted to, in, instead of, again, instead of getting into details, uh, I wanted to just address a few uh, of, of, the, of the staff comments. One that I found somewhat um, disturbing, I guess, was that there was this line that was running through about undesirable elements will be attracted by lower houses. I'm not quite sure how to, how to respond to that. Um, the field of dreams analogy comes into mind. Uh, the, the idea that you build it and people will come is not there. I mean, th these things are price uh, insensitive, and if I took that argument to its extreme, then in order to attract uh, a more desirable clientele, would you or that staff member suggest that fees and taxes should be increased? Hardly. I don't think increasing housing prices will magically bring in uh, higher income clientele. Um, one suggestion was that our graphs were wrong, that if you took five of the ten observations away, that we would get an upward sloping demand curve virtually. I, I was stunned by that. I mean, if, if, if I take any five observations away, and if I pick on them, uh, which ones I can p take away, I, I will be able to generate a lot of interesting uh, relationships. But that, that was hurtful because it suggested that by putting all the observations in that we had, we sort of, sort of generated some uh, strange downward sloping demand curve. I, I, I was stunned by that. One interesting argument by one staff member was that um, perhaps reserves should have built, been built up in the previous cycle and they could be used now. That, that's absolutely right. Um, but, but many of us, for some reason, don't do that. Um, and that staff member suggested perhaps in the next cycle this should be done. Absolutely. I mean, this is the same thing with the California government or the, or the uh, um, federal government. One should build up reserves. But for some reason, we don't do that. Um, um, there, there are other costs involved that we never considered. Uh, they were mentioned in the previous meeting when I was here, such as if you lose your best builders, your best engineers, once they're gone, they're gone. Who, who will leave in a recession is those who can leave. Those who are highest qualified will be able to find a job elsewhere, and you're left with those who are not as well qualified. Um, and they will stay behind because they can't find a job uh, elsewhere. And that's, that's something that was brought up uh, by one of the staff, and, and we agree. Uh, finally, there was a moral hazard uh, problem that was brought up, which was what if you gave the builders these um, fee reductions at the moment, and they wouldn't do anything with it. They would just take it in and then not build for five years. Uh, that's, of course, a question of trust. And if one doesn't have the trust, then that can always be built in into contracts. Uh, to, to make sure that if those fee reductions are given, then they have to be repaid if, if a house is not built within or started within a certain amount of time. Um, that, that, that was all. I, I'm happy to submit the new numbers that we used in calculations based on the 2008 numbers rather than our purely hypothetical example in 2007, um, taking into account what one staff member suggested that we didn't consider the right fees and sales taxes and so forth. So we've redone those numbers without sales taxes. Uh, that, that was not a mistake of ours. It was just simply we weren't aware of the facts. So, so we have adjusted for that. But again, I, I don't think it is, it, is, it is very, from my point of view, uh, it, it's not going to solve anything to get into little details of staff members said this, staff members said this, some staff member put in 
three exclamation marks or three question marks or one said amen and that was all. I, these are all details that, that won't get us uh, uh, anywhere. I think the big picture is we had proposed a temporary program um, that we considered revenue neutral under certain what we thought plausible assumptions. And the question is, do you seriously want to consider it? And, and beyond that, I'm not sure if our, our report will convince you. If you have um, formed your opinions before, it, it leads support, I thought, to the idea that this can be done in a revel, revenue neutral way to stimulate the local economy. That, that was the purpose, nothing else. So uh, that's, that's all that I, that I wanted to add. Questions or comments from members of the council? I have just two. Um, the first one is, once you've redone the numbers, and I tried to get through the updates last night, is it, is it your position based upon your analysis, and I realize there's got to be some slack in the numbers, but somewhere between 25 homes on the low side and maybe 30 at most on the upside, gets us to the revenue neutral position from your analysis? Yeah. So we, we and, and I have those numbers. I wasn't sure that they, they had been transmitted to you. I got um, them by email last night. Okay. So between 27 and uh, 64 additional houses would, in our view, get, get you to a revenue neutral um, position. And, and as you know, when one fits a line, not all observations lie on the curve. So, so is it possible that we're making a mistake here? Of course it, it is possible. How costly will it be? Um, well, th th that's, that's for you to decide. Again, the idea here was to make this a purely temporary uh, idea that can be revisited in, in a year's time. What is the upside? Well, we could have made errors the other way around. Um, we can just talk about averages. I, I can only, there's an interesting story behind every observation. Uh, we can only talk about averages. The second question is, I, I know you were retained specifically to focus on Victorville. Have you done similar studies for other cities in either San Bernardino County or the Inland Empire? No, but one has to start somewhere. And the idea is obviously to, to uh, bring this to, to, uh, to other city councils. Um, in some ways, uh, I, I, I know you may look at this as, so we are the guinea pigs here. Uh, in, in another way, I suppose one, one could look at this in terms of we're taking the lead. Um, if this works out, we look great. If it doesn't work out, I, I, I cannot see the bottom line that there is a big loss, even if these calculations are somewhat off. There will be a loss, but but given the upside that is possible, that that's... Uh... I know you two have a tight schedule, so thank you. Thank you very much. Then we'll go back to where we were at the last meeting, which was uh, Frank Williams. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm Frank Williams, CEO of the Baldy View Chapter of the BIA. Uh, appreciate uh, Ira's remarks and uh, Manfred's remarks uh, to you. Uh, if it's uh, okay with uh, you, Mr. Mayor, and the council, I'd like to proceed with having uh, Jeff Simonetti, our in-house uh, economist, come up and discuss the two uh, pieces of correspondence that uh, uh, we submitted to the city. Uh, you asked uh, a few minutes ago whether they had done any other studies for cities. The, the BIA internally had, had done a similar analysis of, of your fee. In fact, the letter that you uh, received uh, was prepared over three months ago and at the request of several of our members asked us not to submit that letter uh, until uh, Thursday. So we, we did submit uh, the original comments on your fee program. 
Also, yesterday afternoon, we received uh, comments from uh, your community services director, uh, John Gargan, and uh, we worked into the wee hours uh, yesterday to respond to his comments where he indicated that the last time that the council worked with us and uh, deferred fees that the city lost seven million dollars. I think when you hear Jeff's comments, you're going to see that that's really not the case. Uh, going back to another question that you asked Ira about, you know, you were talking to other businesses. What are you doing to help them instead of trying to prop up the building industry? Well, I don't have to remind you, but 20% uh, of the gross uh, county product, per se, is from the home building industry. And car dealers, I have a good friend who's a car dealer. He told me that uh, his sales were down 25%. And one of the reasons was that people are losing their jobs, and most of those people are people who had jobs in the construction industry. Uh, every business is suffering. Uh, we probably wouldn't be as uh, aggressive about coming and asking for a boost had it not been for one little element in this downturn that we haven't seen in the past, and that was the subprime market and the foreclosures that uh, you were talking about. There's an article this morning in the Daily Press that cites that three out of four cells right now are the foreclosures, so they are moving. And uh, I just received a, uh, a uh, report from Market Point Realty Advisors who made presentations at the uh, uh, mayor's conference that you attended, uh, Mr. Mayor. And it's actually bright news. It says San Bernardino County new home sales up, in inventory down, hence only four to five months of fi supply available to buyers. And uh, the uh, standing inventory uh, this last month has just decreased about 9%, but we're still uh, trying to get those foreclosures off. The legislature even has, has a bill in to address the concern that you had, uh, Councilman Hunter, about uh, the condition of these foreclosures, they're, they're going to require the banks to maintain the properties while they're sitting uh, vacant. That's in the Senate now. Uh, so we expect to see that uh, pull. But even the state is uh, talking about legis or they're actually acting on legislation to try to help defer fees and extend maps and things like that. And I'd like to reiterate that in our proposal, we asked for a two-year uh, break. However, we also said that if permits start coming back, uh, then you adjust the feedback to where it is. And I j just want you to be clear that it, we're only asking for temporary uh, help. So at this point, I'd like to call uh, Jeff Simonetti, with your permission, uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions you have uh, after uh, Jeff's comments. Thank you. Now, before I begin, did everybody get copies of the memo? I have extra copies if anyone needs it. Okay, great. Uh, yesterday afternoon, Frank asked me to take a look at the memo that Mr. Gargan had sent us regarding the development impact fee loss that the city had suffered as a result of the phase-ins that we had received for the past, from May 2002 up through 2006. And the memo that we put together particularly deals with the time period from January 2006 to the present. And the reason why we looked at this is that I looked at the particular studies, the 2005 Development and Impact Fee Study that Mr. Agajanian put together, as well as the 2006 study that Mr. Agajanian put together. 
And I didn't look at any of the studies beforehand because we haven't looked at those studies before from, say, 2002, 2003, 2004. Um, I began working at the BIA in August of 2005, actually, just as you guys had passed the 2005 Development Impact Fee Update. If you recall back in September of 2006, the original fee proposal was $14,578 per single family unit. However, if you recall, there were some pretty significant flaws in the development impact fee report. Uh, if you, for most having to do with the park level of service, which had equated to about 6.3 acres per thousand of parks. And if you recall, the city adjusted that figure to remove those approximately 177 acres of parkland that was in the development impact fee report that was flawed. That adjusted the fee down to $10,947, which was a decrease of $3,631 per unit. Looking back on the 2005 study, which Mr. Agajanian put together as well, the same problems and same flaws were in that development impact fee study. So for example, there were still 6.34 acres per thousand of parks in that development impact fee study at that point. The the city of Victorville used that same study that was passed in September of 2005 for all of 2006 with those flawed figures in there. If you recall in 2006, it was one of the most banner years in the city of Victorville in terms of permits pulled, which they had 3,078 permits issued in 2006. Now, if you redo the numbers that the city of Victorville used in 2000, the 2005 study to correct them for what the city pulled out in 2000, the 2006 study, you will find that the corrected number should have been $6,366 per single family unit, just using those figures that the city agreed upon in 2006 to remove, because they were the same exact problems that were in the study in 2005. So you see there were 3,078 permits pulled which means that there was an overage of over $4 million in the, city of 2000, in the city in 2006, just in particular. So we are not advocating that obviously the city return any of that money or do anything of the sort. I particularly are pointing out these comments to state that while it may look like there was a diff revenue loss, if the study had been correct at the time, these numbers would be a lot different. Frank also asked me to just review quickly the fee points that we put together in our letter. There are a few points that we wanted to point out about some adjustments that we believe are, should be done in the 2007 study that you have before you. Now we recognize the initial development impact fee point that the Rose Institute had asked was to remove all the line items with the exception of transportation. Now, at your request, and we agree, the most important thing is to have fire and police in, in there as well. So we've put those back in. Looking at some difficulties in the study, for example, on some cost adjustments, if you'll go to page seven of this letter, the one dated May 9th, in some cost escalator adjustments in particular, the information that John McGlade sent us states that building costs were escalated by 7.5% based on research utilizing several contractors and an architect. However, if you look at some of the line items in, in the budget and in the capital improvements plan, you'll see a few interesting points. Uh, for example, the city estimated the Civic Center, the Library and Community Center, uh, would cost 12,000, 12, excuse me, $12,500,000 12 in two, the 2006 study. In 2007, the study estimates it'll cost $22 million, which is a 76% increase, rather than the 7.5% that they say that they're going to escalate on. In 2006, the city suggested that the satellite library line item would cost $3 million, and now it's costing $5.5 million in 2007, which is an 83% increase. You're also seeing cost adjustments completed for the completed city hall, saying that it originally was gonna cost $30 million, now we're seeing $35 million. So there are some cost adjustments here that we're not understanding where they're coming from. As well, the park adjustments. 
Now, we've seen land costs come down, and the study has adjusted its land costs. However, in terms of site development costs, where we supposedly saw a 7.5% increase, Mr. McGlade is stating that there are a $100,000 per acre increase, which is about a 25% increase. So there are some discrepancies here that we're seeing within the development impact fee proposal as a whole. And as a result, our recommendations and what we believe the adjusted cost should be is $8,900 per single family unit. That would be the basis of where we believe the study should be adjusted from. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions or comments from members of the council? Uh, I would have uh, two comments. Sure. In reverse order. The first, if we are successful next month in mm -hmm. converting to a charter city, one of the first things that I will ask this council to do is to put the park development program in your lap. Because I've talked to many of the builders, some have been in this room every mm -hmm. time we've met, who say you can do it for a lot less than the city, and I believe you. So one of the ways to, to deal with that debatable cost component, because everybody's got their own numbers, sure. is to let you folks do it, pursuant to standards, of course, that would have to be developed by the city. So you know, whether that's going to shake out or not, we won't know till June, but that is mm -hmm. something that uh, I feel very strongly about. And that making adjustment to a charter city will be either way in June, you mentioned? It's on the ballot. In on June. the ballot, okay. We'll, Secondly, we'll throw that in Jim's lap. He can take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, um, I'm going to let Mr. Gargan sure. uh, and Mr. Roberts you know, respond to the statistical analysis of the park thing. That's you know, beyond my pay grade for sure. sure. But I just want to comment. I, I, can't, I can't hold myself back. Your, your, uh, your, your analysis of, a, of the overpayment, if you adjust the numbers, mm -hmm. would lead to you know, different uh, results. That, that very well may be true. Uh, I have used that argument with the BIA every time we have delayed the implementation of fee adjustments, because we cannot go back retroactively. And so, yes, there may have been a, a, an overpayment, maybe, on the park side, but if you were going to get that minutia in, in terms of uh, your analysis, I think I would argue that you have to also look at the money, the fee increases that weren't paid for multiple months while we postponed the implementation of diff fee increases. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think in the gross, there may be some trade-offs, and it may be equal. I mean, I'm, nobody's done that study, sure. so I don't well, know. Well, I actually took that into consideration. If you take a look at the, um, the table that I put together, in 2006, for example, for the first six months of 2006, there was a phase-in portion, if you will recall. The Development impact fees that passed in late 2005, I believe, went into effect in January of 2006 because they were passed in late September, early October, and went into effect as of January of 2006. The first six months, what was actually charged was $7,038 a single family unit, which went up for the rest of the year from July through December of 2006 to $9,595 per single family unit. And then in January of 2007 went up to 10,947. If you look particularly at the numbers that got adjusted in 2007 and just pull those numbers out of the 2005 study, which the same flaws were in the 2005 study, just those numbers, the fee for per single family unit would have actually been lower than what was actually charged during the phase in. So if those numbers were correct, that 9595 was the correct number, then yes, your assumptions would be correct. However, the same difficulties and challenges that we saw in the 2006 study were in the 2005 study, and the corrected number actually should have been lower than what was actually charged in the phase in. So that is where the, the difference is coming from in our analysis. Any other questions or comments from members of the council? Thank you. We'll go back to Mr. Williams. I, I do have other cards. I mean, okay. Tatum.
Mayor, members of the council, my name is Jim Tatum, long-time resident of the Valley here. And it seemed to me that after we went through this process, we kind of lost track of what we were trying to accomplish with the, uh, the fees. We weren't asking for a long-term fee reduction. We were asking for a short-term fee reduction only on certain items that we thought could be postponed without harming the community and without harming the new citizens moving in. And we'd leave everything else on the table and leave it alone. We would pay our fair share of everything else but, but those items. And I look around and see what items we're talking about, and one of them was obviously the parks. Well, parks must not be very important when we're tearing out the oldest park in Victorville. I drove by there today, and there's not even a tree standing, and I, you know, I guess I, I kind of know why. But that doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't look good for what this council is trying to do is say, no, we can't, we have to build these parks because the citizens demand them. Well, nobody demanded that one, so we tore it out. Well, that's fair. I know why the reason was for that. But, you know, when we look at where you're going to put these parks and when they're going to be used, uh, a year's delay in these parks, I don't think it's going to make any difference to the community as far as the building community and people moving into these households. To put a, a major park at, uh, out at the old George Air Force Base and talk about gas prices to get the people out there to play soccer or whatever, you're asking for a housewife to spend almost $20 round trip to take her kids out there to play soccer. Well, how long is that going to last? You know, you got to we got to look at things kind of practical. What we're doing here in Victorville. So I think the the fee that we're asking for to be decreased or put on hold is not going to have that big of an effect on the city as a whole. I'm not in favor of, of setting aside and not doing the dip fees for the roads because we all know that's a problem. We all know there's a problem with the crime in the fire department. So we leave those alone. But, you know, when I read through the comments that we have from the department heads, a couple of things really struck me here as, as looking back through the years. And one of the things that we started doing was we started creating jobs for the first time in a long time since the George Air Force Base was closed. So I look at the jobs that we are creating out there, and most of them are warehouse jobs. That's what the city council has moved forward to, and we all appreciate it. Let me tell you, it's a great deal. Unfortunately, those jobs don't pay a lot of money. You're going to have those warehouse people making $15 an hour. That means the majority of them, unless their wife is working, can only afford a $200,000 home. Period. That's it. It's always been that way. So in order to get high-end houses up here, we need high-end jobs. And you're not going to get high-end jobs if we're going to, you know, it just takes time as the area grows to make that happen. I remember years back when Bill Porter was in charge of trying to get industry up here. And he worked his tail off year after year after year. And the reason we couldn't get him up here is because we didn't have the population to sustain the jobs. Well, it seems like we're starting to get there now and we can sustain those jobs. We see that with what's being built up here. As far as the educational process that you guys talked about, that we need a higher education uh, uh, for our, our people here. I'm all for that. I think we should do more for the schools than we do now and more for the junior colleges than we do now because those kids are not getting trained to go to work. Anytime you hire a young person, his work ethics are non-existent. You have to teach him from the ground up. Most of them can't even balance a checkbook, let alone do much else for you. So I think we need to really look and examine in our hearts what we're doing for the city of Victorville and how is this going to have an impact. you got to have the house. you got to have the houses filled up you got to have the people here to buy the goods. They're going to keep the tax revenue coming. And I feel sorry for the car dealers, but, you know, uh, you're asking for do, two different things there. You could either delay the sales tax revenue, but if we could stimulate the housing market and get more people coming in, you're going to get more people buying merchandise up here. And maybe we can keep them up here from going down, down the hill to buy things. But I think we should just sit back and look. We're not asking for a long-term fix a short-term fix so we can get back on our feet a little better. That's my say today. Thank you. Questions or comments from members of the council? I, I just have a comment, Mr. Tatum. I have to just disagree with you on the park issue. I can't tell you how many times a week I hear from people, parents of kids who play soccer and baseball and want to know when we're going to build more parks for them to play. If you ask Mr. Gargan or any of the AYSO, there's not enough, there's not enough fields to play on. 
We can't book enough of them to play on. We need more parks. And you talk about closing Forest Park. I think you know why we closed Forest Park. And that's really not a good analogy to even bring it up. It's nothing but druggies that were down there, sex problems down there. That's a park that can't be used. It was built back in the early 1900s. D so Street's one of the most dangerous. Let me finish, depot there before Let me that, finish so. Mr. Tatum. D Street is one of the most dangerous streets down there for people to walk across. That park's being closed down for public safety reasons. It can never be used for anything and wasn't used for anything but vagrants. So that's why it's closed down. We need parks in this community. We need them for the kids. So we do need to build those parks. I don't disagree. We've been incorporated since 1962. Why haven't we built any soccer fields? I believe we've built soccer fields. If you go out to the school down the Mesa Avenue, there's new soccer I fields. I mean, you, you say we haven't done all these things. You know, we've been incorporated a long time. If we're going to have a program to do these parks, then we need to implement them and not just say, well, we're going to have a little park here and a little park here. But all of a sudden, I look at your park list, and you're asking for it, astronomical dollars to build two regional parks, one in George Air Force Base, and one across the tracks, I'm going, give me a break. We're not building houses out of George. We're not building houses over there by Eva Dell School. Not just where houses are, Mr. Tatum. Oh, so we want the people to pay for gas. You know, it's not to deal with gas. It has to do with the, the, the lifestyle here in Victorville that people want to use the parks. And I can guarantee you, you build that park at George, it will be full every day with people playing baseball and soccer and other things. We have kids. You probably don't have young kids anymore like I don't. But there's a lot of leagues out here that want to I support a lot of kids, not my kids, but a lot of other kids. Well, and I understand that. I'm not arguing the point that we don't need them. But we do need them. And, and you know what I'm them. saying? But uh, to look at what we're doing to the overall economy to the housing market up here, is it, is it wise to, to postpone things for a year and get us back on our feet? Or is it just that you guys, we're not going to issue any more building permits, so let's do the park piece where we're at. And the hell with you guys. I mean, if that's the attitude, fine, that's the attitude. We'll take that. I'm, I've been here a long time. You know, I know that the world changes as we sit here and look at it. And if, you know, if we don't get any help from the city council, we're not going to all just leave town and die. Well, you know, it's, uh, we've been here through recessions before, and we've sustained them in not very good shape, but we always came through them. But I don't think there's been very many times that we come in here and ask for help. The last time I remember coming here and asking for help, when you asked about how come you didn't get these revenue dollars in for the park that, because we were arguing about fees, the biggest problem I've ever had with the city of Victorville ever in my life was how do I get a subdivision improved? How come it takes me three years and I missed half the market last time because I couldn't get a subdivision improved? When you personally told me you'll have them improved in 120 days, you personally told me and that never happened, never. So if I go back and say, what happened to our business plan? How come the city don't have more revenue? Don't put it on me. You better look at what your staff was doing for you. We couldn't get a subdivision approved. Three years to get a subdivision approved. You know how many markets we missed in three years? I'm not looking you probably at you could have built revenue. twice as many houses and got twice as much money. I'm not looking at you why revenues aren't there. That's not what this is about. This is about the diff fees right now, and that's what we're oh, I know. At. I understand that. And I'm looking at what's best for this community, not just for one organization. Well, believe me, I am too. I've been here a long time, and I'm not leaving, so I'm going to, you know, this is community is, is a big part of my life. So, you know, we're asking for help today. I and, uh, you know, and let's just don't look over, overlook it and say, hey, we're not going to help you guys. And, and that's not my point. My point was everybody comes to the dais and say, well, we don't need to do this right now. We do need to do it right now. And I'm not just going to look at the builders. I'm going to look at what my citizens out there that voted for me want to do. And I'm talking about people who come to me and say, I want these things. Well, okay, how do we do what you want and you want and you want? The old saying is you can have anything you want, but just have, can't have everything you want. We have to decide what we're going to do and what's best for this community. And it's the whole community. Oh, I agree. Okay, then that's what I have to decide. But when we, pick, when we try to pick out something that's going to be say what is the most instrumental thing the city needs to keep in place is the road fees. We know we've got a real problem with that. We don't dare walk away from the police and fire department. Nope. So that leaves us very few things to take a look at and say, where can we expect to get some help from? You know, and so the only thing we do is come back and ask you for that help. If you don't want to give it to us, hey, don't give it to us. You know, I mean, that's just, that's the city council's attitude if they want to take it. I don't have a problem with that. I resent it. But I don't have a problem with it. I and think I we deserve that. I want to give help to everybody I can. I just okay. can't give it to everybody. You got it. Thank you. Mr. Any other questions or comments? I, have, I apologize if I missed the time frame. And I was trying to get Rudy to help me. <laughs> um, but 
Well, I'm sorry. I have I've family to take too. care of before. <laughs> anyway, um, what was the time frame, Mr. Tatum, that you're asking for as far as the parks and facilities? You know, I think we could look at it for a year and then take a look at it. The market's changed during that period of time. I think that it behoves the, the, the BIA and the city to get back together and say, look, we're starting to issue more permits. The permits are up 50 percent. We need to put in the fees again. I mean, it's, it, how quick do I think the market's going to come back? We're starting to sell, getting more traffic up there all the time to sell houses. And uh, it seems like, you know, I don't know how many more foreclosures are going to hit the valley, but the foreclosures are being sold pretty rapidly by the existing realtors. So it looks like, in, in our opinion, we're going to see a change in the market, you know, towards the end of 2009 and going into 2010. Now, you know, so we're talking about a, a year that we're a going year. to be sitting there kind of looking and seeing what's going on. It would be great if we had a crystal ball. Yeah. And, be able to and you know, it. and I don't think any builder's going to say, hey, we don't want to take, come look at this thing for a year or two years. What we're saying is if we come back and the city says, hey, we need to get together, our permits have been increased by 50 percent, we seem like we're on our way back to sit down and figure out how we could get it reinstated. Okay, so that would not be a drop dead no. one year. If it was five months, six months, we saw things starting to come around, we can get together again and, and talk Absolutely. about Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tate, before you leave, uh, I have a flyer that deals with the uh, Ontario situation indicates that the Ontario City Council approved an eight-month deferral with a 1.8 million cap. Um, what is your uh, feeling about uh, uh, the position that Ontario has taken? Let me tell you historically what's happened in the high desert. As the housing market changes, we're always the first one to go down in the past and the last one to come back. The housing market is, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, the price of houses dropped pretty dramatically in the Ontario, Rancho Cucamonga, Fontana, Colton, in the area down there that people down there, they don't have to move up here because they could get affordable houses down there at, you know, at the lower prices now. So I could see where theirs will be a shorter lived than ours will by, you know, maybe three months, four months. But I could see us putting on, on a, uh, a cap on the deal for revenue and saying, okay, when we hit this revenue, guys, all bets are off. I mean, uh, you know, there has to be some place we could draw the line and say, hey, let's take a look at it. I mean, I would not for putting this in forever. I don't think anybody is. We just need the short-term help to keep the, to keep the wheels going. Any other questions or comments? I think what, what we're talking about is, it, if I hear it right, is that we already passed the road fees, and there's no problem with the police nope. or, um, or the fire. Nope. Fees. So we're down just to the facilities and the parks. Correct. And so I think we just kind of need to focus on that and, and, and make a determination whether if, if there is a suspension, uh, is how much is it going to cost the city and can we afford it or not? So I, I agree. And I think the other thing that we kind of left out from the at least – in my perspective from a home builder that uh, where these parks are going. And, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not a good idea to put a park out of George Air Force Base, but I think there's other places that are needed just as bad where their people are already living than to go out there where there's no, not going to be any houses. Yeah, are they going to drive out there? Yeah, because we're going to force them to drive out there, of course. But, I mean, you know, I think that uh, if we're paying for them, I'd like to have a little more say in where they're going to go. Well, I think part of it that might drive it is the very thing that troubles your industry and you and the conversations we've had and the cost of land. Oh, yeah. Obviously, the cost of land at George Air Force Base. Well, it's pretty cheap. Yeah, you can't be. <laughs> and, and I agree. We don't have to surcharge you or your, your peers for the land cost, which has been a big bone of contention. And, you know, and I've gotten other cities, Terry, to give you a good idea, like Bakersfield's got a great uh, – park and rec area over there, and they have a soccer fields that are, you just can't, unbelievable the amount of soccer fields they put in. And it's quite a ways from town. It's not near the population base. The other thing that, you know, people have to be, you know, taking their kids to and from there quite a bit. And, uh, you know, which has some drawbacks to it, but uh, they have the tournaments over there in Bakersfield, and people drive from here over to Bakersfield to a soccer tournament, so it's not, you know, if your kids are into it, they're into it. Certainly. 
I have one more. First, this is for either John or Andre. When this, I'm positive thinking, this charter city passes, how long before everything will go into effect? In other words, where we could turn around to the BIA and say, okay, you guys are now responsible for our parks. How long would that be? It would essentially be uh, about 30 days after the charter is in effect. Um, what you'd have to do is, is adopt ordinances, uh, making adjustments to your municipal code to address those issues. Uh, and then it's basically a 30-day window period and then just it's a function of how that falls with respect to council meetings. So I'd say 30, 45 days, something like that. Maybe July, August. And the potential benefit of the Charter City is not simply limited to this park issue. It could potentially reduce our cost of road construction, all of our infrastructure construction. Underworks, yeah, big time. Yeah. The cost of the bill, uh, virtually every item in the development impact fee study that then relates to a development impact fee upon developers has the potential to be reduced under a charter city. So the benefits are much broader than simply parks and recreation facilities. The only reason I focused on parks is I've had discussions with Jim yeah. multiple times and with Ira and with others about it seems the biggest bone of contention is the cost of the parks, right. land acquisition and, and right. development and so. But, but John's right. I mean, it covers the whole gamut of public works uh, types. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before you go on, I know we're going to have to get out of here. Can we kind of discuss what we're going to do? Because I'm limited on my schedule of coming back and back and back for this issue. Uh, no, we got 10 minutes. I don't have 10 minutes. We got to no, get we, out. We, I advised the, the audience that we had to be out of this room by five minutes till because we're involved in the Fallen Officer Memorial Program next door. We have two cards of people, actually three cards, of people left to speak. So we're not going to be able to complete it today. It just simply can't. You've got to give everybody an opportunity to, uh, to be heard. And then we have to have an right. uh, opportunity for dialogue. Mr. Rothschild. I, I listened to all this. I've digested this ad in for nauseum, whatever you want to say. It. It's coming out of my ears, but um, thought I had, and it actually kind of played off the Ontario uh, uh, letter that came out. My, my thought was that this council would consider, um, remember, we've got several months into this freeze, if you will, because we can't reach backwards in time. We're already marching ahead. If we, at this moment, made a decision to freeze the fees for six months, with an automatic uh, uh, increase to the proposed level that we had uh, suggested in the beginning of the study here, uh, that that might be somewhat of a compromise. My, my guess is, and the analysis that went through my head was the 25, 30 houses, whatever, however many houses that we're going to say, let's call it 100 houses, that permanent impact is probably minimal compared to uh, a, long, a long look at this. and. Um, my guess is that we could probably absorb that uh, a lot better than than considering a year or two down the line and, and, and takes off. So my thought was the council might consider a, a freeze of six months uh, from this meeting date and uh, and then at the end of that six months it automatically, there's no debate, there's no discussion about anything else. It, the, the motion is that it will automatically go to the uh, set fee structure that we have. That, that was my thought and then I basically just keyed off the Ontario. Uh, that would be just the... Um, the yeah, the, the housing, right, the, the part that's left of our diffs, right, not the whole amount. Well, that, that may be uh, something that the council wants to consider, but we've got three minutes, and I've got cards of people who want to speak. And interest of fairness, I think everybody has to have their shot, so... Uh, Got to continue. What is the next possible date for you? Well, day early mornings are fine, but that's you know. When do you want to do it? Quick as possible. Great. Is there any way we can come back after? No, I'm not ready to act on. Not wait. Not in three minutes. I mean, I appreciate the offer. Obviously, you can speak for Carlos. I don't know whether you can speak for Don Brown or not. He submitted a card. And we cut you off last time. Certainly, you can waive your right to complete your comments. But you know, the, the, the council's got to have some time to, to 
pick this around, three minutes is not enough. So we're going to have to now. I'm willing to come back in the morning if that uh, works with anybody else's schedule. Our morning's fine with me. Yeah, I think I'm okay. Eight o'clock again? Um, works for me. Eight o'clock is fine with me. Eight o'clock? Eight a.m.? <laughs> Okay, we'll reconvene, we'll, we'll continue this discussion, this workshop, till tomorrow morning at uh, 8 o'clock. Uh, we will complete the cards that we have and any others that may spring up. Uh, and then, uh, hopefully at that point, the council will uh, have enough information that it can have some uh, discussion and reach a decision. I would ask Mr. Gargan to take a look at the analysis that uh, challenges your assumptions and your calculations so we have some uh, feel for that and if somebody can take a look at the at the numbers that were recrunched by the Rose Institute and Mr. Keel um, I don't want to have this thing go on and on and on you know one group says this and another group says that but um, I sense that we are moving to a point where um, we should be in a position tomorrow to uh, to conclude uh, this uh, whole process. We've got a cap, not to exceed 10 a.m. because Rudy has a 10 o'clock tomorrow. We can put whatever cap the council wants. That's fine with me. So eight to 10. I got to be out here anyway. And you, shall we make it a commitment that we will make a decision yes. by 10 o'clock? Yes. Okay. This meeting will stand continued till 8 a.m. tomorrow morning.